Hey, Jonathan, how you doing? Doing all right. You just scared the bejesus out of me. Forgot I was in here. Oh, by talking? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you forgot you were here. <laughs> Oh, wow, this is new. The chat appears to be preserved from. The, are you seeing the previous chats mm -hmm. in the chat box? Uh, I have not. I think that's only for like admins. Okay, it must be just because I. Yeah, it must be because I'm logged in as chaos. So while we're waiting here, I mean, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about how you, like, what would the date, let me just ask a very technical-ish question. What would the data need to be shaped like um, if I was to give you a bunch of network data from like Augur for a bunch of projects? Because um, is it just, uh, is it just, uh, what do you call it? Uh, node is it uh basically a list of node basically a pair of nodes constituting an edge is that all you need is like a list of nodes with direction uh that would work we'd refactor it into what we need uh, but yeah that that would work cool. and it's currently just a csv sheet uh, hey, so if can come come in this uh, csv that would be fantastic but it doesn't need to be How are you doing, Sean? Hey, Dan. How have you been? I'm well. Well, I think you, I think you up were in not... Wisconsin today. I'm sorry. What? I I I, I think I missed the tail end of what you said. Oh, okay. I, I just I, I was thinking the last time uh, I think we were going to talk, you were not well, so that's why I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. I was. Yeah. I think it was two weeks ago, my bike accident. Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, sorry. I'm going to, I'm actually going to go jump off and jump back on because the, I think the audio is a little bit off for me. So let me see if I can. Fix that. Yeah. All right. It might be me. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I could give you weights to Jonathan and give you weights. Weight would be lovely. Um, yep. Yeah. So we don't integrate weights in uh, the Kumu map, but uh, having them will let us play around with it in a different way. Yeah, I think um, we give people a few minutes to get here. Um, I guess we're, it's been five after. Um, Dan, what I was talking with Jonathan about is he demonstrated some things uh, at Open Source Summit North America and in a couple of our other chaos calls where he's taking a whole bunch of um, research related nodes and operationalizing them in, in ways that are very networky and dense. Um, it's Moss. Dan's actually on the kind of interesting. Uh, steering committee for OSI. Okay. He's very well aware of Moss. Okay. <laughs> it's just fun. It's a okay. small world in space. It is. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, yeah, I was, I... And I was just. Uh, I was just on a call. Uh, sorry, are we, are we recording? Oh, we are recording. Uh, Where uh, are we? Oh, I guess we are. I didn't realize. I guess this meeting must be set up to automatically record. So, um, yes, all the banter has been recorded. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just. Uh, I was. I was just on a uh, on a call that one of uh, that was talking to me about something, and and there had been a previous uh, discussion with some of the chaos people about the same thing. So it was. It's kind of interesting to again to see these connections happening in different places. Yeah, and I don't know if you caught the Jonathan. I think um, I can't remember which organization it was. It was the library guy. Was he at Stanford yesterday? The yeah. other person who talked in that meeting. Zach. Yeah. Yeah. Zach. There you. There you. They're using Neo4j, and I think, I think some of the problems you're having visualizing networks in a performant way like that is probably solved by an or like just having the graphs stored that way. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, 
we've, we've like I think so the, we, I think that it will be difficult to to do. Yeah, go ahead. Well, we, we we've got sort of a roadmap for for Moss, and that beginning was just to do a proof of concept. And Kumu is a plug and play with database, so you don't need to play with CSV sheet, so you don't need to build anything intricate. Uh, but we've begun porting everything over to Neo4j, which makes things so much easier. <laughs> so definitely, you are right. It will it makes the performance magnitude better. You do sacrifice some of the very cool front end features that uh, Kumu has developed, which is a shame, but we're going to try and rebuild those with a uh, different application. Yeah, that's good. I, I was, um, when I was at Fosden in February, I was talking with um, Santi, who's a Biturgia a Grimoire Lab maintainer which is another piece of software in the chaos project. And, you know, kind of our consensus is that technically and actually in reality, really most of the, a lot of this open source data is organically a graph. And so graph databases are going to perform much faster for a lot of tasks. However, very few people understand them and how to query them. And that is probably why a lot of us are still in a relational world. Yeah, and Neo4j is actually a good company in this regard because they have a bunch of educational content. They have a lot of webinars that help folks learn how to use it. Uh, it's just lovely. Yeah. So um, let me just, uh, I guess, formally start. Um, good good discussion. Uh, I'd like to kind of get a sense of what, what it is that, um, like, Addy, Glad to see you here. Um, I uh, and uh, Dan, like what? What are some of the things that? What are the current things that the Chaos Project could bring metrics or data science or stuff to the the other things that you're working on? Where um, we could maybe build some work around things that are important to you. So something that um, I can share, uh, Greg and I were really <clears throat> looking into um, all of the, the models and the matrix. So for some of the ones that are models, we really wanted to understand more information about what the model was, but the description page sometimes doesn't provide that. So we were thinking like, okay, maybe we could adopt some of these models for our projects. Because the main reason why we were going through that is we wanted to get some feedback for Dawn because at some point she had really helped us get everything, uh, all of our projects into Augur. And we wanted to see which matrix were on there. And we wanted to see which other matrix we should request, which would be meaningful for our projects. So we went through looking through all of the community matrix that Chaos has on there to see, oh, maybe this would be interesting or the model would be good. Um, so two, two questions really out there, like, is there another place where we could find more information about the models? And then second, could we really pick anything to go into the Augur dashboard or do we have some limitations there? Um, so anything is a wide universe. Um, but by anything, think... like anything listed on, on Chaos as matrix pages. I think any metric model that's derived from trace data can be generated using the data that's in Augur. I think some of the metric models that, for example, are focused on uh, leadership or uh, I would say more qualitative survey like data or response data where we don't have electronic traces that we can construct a, a dashboard item from. Those models, of course, are less difficult to construct, or more difficult to construct with trace data, they can't be constructed. Um, they're not suitable for dashboards. But, you know, if you look at the underlying metrics and see that, you know, I think you probably know, you can look at a metric model and see if the metrics are coming from a, a survey or if they're coming from trace data. Like, I, I don't think there's a ton of secret about um, so the difference. Like, I think it's, I think you probably know, Eddie. Sean, so is there like a schema or more information about what is actually available in the underlying database that would help us maybe select a few more things to go on the dashboard? 
There, there is. Um, I'm going to say that uh, a longstanding task on Sean's list is to get this more clearly documented. And there are some, and I'm trying to think of ways to bring it forward. Um, but I will, uh, I'll put a link in here for where the schema is in our docs. Thank you. Some stuff is super slow today. So if you go to the schema page, there's you can get the whole schema on one page, or you can look at the parts of the schema um, that exist. I think. Um, okay, sorry. I'm obviously there. We go. So yeah, you can. That's. I mean, if there's data on GitHub that you want, chances are that it exists in the Augur schema. Like we go all the way down the rabbit hole of every message, for example, which is a ton of data. Gotcha. This is something that I was specifically looking for was that um, wanted to find out, uh, and this is slightly broader than just our projects, but would apply to our projects in the future. So I think that um, it's trying to find a way to get from GitHub data if projects belong to foundations or are in foundations related org. And I believe that there is some way in the GitHub API to, to get that information. But if it's already in chaos, I think that'd be great to have. So I'll check out this. Like Don, Don, I'm going to ask Don about that. Like, I know I, I have a list of CNCF projects that I don't know if I have it reflected. It's not reflected clearly that they're in a foundation in the dashboards on Augur. But we know what those projects are. Are, are you, Don? Do you know? Have you seen anything where the actual foundation is listed in the GitHub API? No, it's it's definitely not in the GitHub API. Um, but there there are some some data sources we might be able to match. So there are a bunch of landscape projects which have very nicely formatted um, JSON files, which have most of the LF projects and the CNCF projects. Um, and then we could probably do something similar, like get a list of Apache projects, for example, or Eclipse projects. We could probably, it would take a bit of manual work, but we could probably match some of that up for at least for the big foundations. Um, there's certainly, there's loads of foundations out there and it's sometimes hard to match the projects up, but, uh, but we might be able to do it at least for some projects or for a smaller subset of projects maybe that you, that you cared about. Sure, yeah, and I mean, then I will, oh, go ahead, Addy. Because what I was hoping to do, sort of do like the bigger idea was that uh, for some of these foundations, what do the matrix of their projects look like? So those are some example matrix for projects maybe aspiring to join the foundation. So if we knew like which projects those were because we somehow access to some foundation mapping list, I think it'd be a nice way, a different way to go about and say, here's what others who already belong to this community are doing. Don, I don't, did I answer your question? Yeah, that's really. Yeah, and uh, just on another, on another note, I will, um, I will be presenting on sustainability metrics at um, ASK. So I know, Addy, that you're not going to be able to make it, unfortunately, which is, which is super sad. It would have been great to meet you in person. Um, yeah. But I'm hoping that uh, Greg and I can carve out some time while we're there and maybe dive into it a bit deeper than we're going to be able to during the, the mini symposium on sustainability. So hopefully we can start we can start working on, on some of that as well. And then the other thing I will mention, and I've included the links to them here, we have just launched some uh, practitioner guides, which um, really do get at some of the sustainability metrics and, and how to make improvements that will impact the sustainability of your projects. Because the first the first three topics that we picked for the practitioner guides were responsiveness, contributor sustainability, and organizational participation, all of which have a big impact on sustainability. So I think uh, I think you might find some of those practitioner guides interesting to read as well. Mm -hmm. so and they're more about how to interpret the metrics that you have. So it's like it's like a step path a step past um, just finding the metrics and 
how do you take what you're learning from those metrics and improve your projects? Sure. So, so Don, I wanted to ask a question that we have gotten ourselves. It, can we link some of these metrics back to literature or to something else? Because people ask us, like, how do you know these are the best metrics? Why should I trust you about that? How do you go about that's tracking an, data? <laughs> that's an excellent <laughs> question. I we have not done a good job of linking those back to back to research and some cases, some of the metrics down the references section do have links to papers. If, if that happened to be part of either the data that we used when we were creating the metric, or maybe just, you know, somebody, somebody put that reference there. I would say if, if you have any references for some of the metrics that you were looking at back to the data that we can, we can add those to the existing metrics. I think a lot of them, rather than coming from research data, came from those of us who've been doing this for a long time and from our personal experience, uh, which is not a good answer to your question, I know, because it, yeah. it doesn't necessarily come well, from research. A lot of it came from experience. Greg and I well, had actually run a work. Lab. Oh, sorry. Go for it. No, you go ahead, Eddie. So go. I was uh, providing some context that Greg and I had uh, were running this uh, matrix workshop at Enlit. And we had a lot of good discussion. And because mostly, you know, the, the group of people that were trying to figure out this matrix are, are mainly scientists, they had a lot of questions very similar to this way. It's like, you're telling me I should be doing this. Intuitively, I don't see that, but why should I trust you? Where's the reference to this? And we were like, these are really good questions. We need to note them down and we need to, to probably ask you and then also try to find out, like, if we are going to probably tell some scientific community users, then they are generally curious, where are you getting this data? Why should I trust this data? Why should I follow this practice? So I thought I'd share that feedback here. I'll, I'll, I guess what I will share is that the, one of the reasons I you know, helped start chaos and remain engaged in it is because I spent many years early in my career working around the mining software repositories community and some of the software engineering communities and for the most part they really don't do a great job of showing how the things that they measure connect to practice and reality and chaos approaches it more from a okay what do practitioners need and and then how do we shape those metrics so that they're useful and put them in context and i think so that's one observation that that there isn't a lot of okay here's the metric now is it real is it useful to people and i think the chaos project because it's been very engaged with folks who actually do this work inside of companies and labs and things our, our metrics are the things that people use and that they've kind of people like don have tested over time and people like don know what to look for um and there may not be a scientific paper around all of it that's not that there shouldn't be and that we shouldn't probably write it. Um, the the other observation that that I have here is, I think, I think there's a lot that um, when when so when people see metric when people see metrics they want a scorecard they want to say good bad medium right and most of the way that we've treated metrics have been uh, okay what's your context. We provide the metrics, but we need you to interpret them for your project because there isn't an absolute, here's here's some array of metrics, and if you hit them, your project is good. And I think you probably see that yourself, Addy, because your question earlier about is there a list of foundations somewhere that the projects are associated with, that suggests to me that you're possibly honing in on the way I kind of think anyway, which is that Okay, if I can find some reference set of projects that I, I know that they're in different states, then I can measure, then I can compare my projects to those projects. I can cluster my projects using those projects as training data. I babbled. Did I, I don't know if that enlightened anything, but. No, no, I think so. I, you know, I'm very much in the practitioner world myself, so I definitely understand that, but I think it's uh, just a little bit tricky. So it, I don't know if there were any references. I think it would be valuable to collect those because I'm pretty sure that some of these concepts have been studied a lot, maybe not necessarily in computer science, but in sort of like organizational psychology, business, 
So I'm sure that there are long-standing um, reasons to do to to kind of link it back to. So that was just something that we had written down that yes, probably you know we should come up with some reason saying like look, this has been practiced a lot here or this has been like some um, history or provenance to where it comes from. It may not be a paper. It may be like, you know, this is practiced by 17 organizations or all top organizations. Something to, to back that up is what I had written down in our notes because we had quite a, an extensive discussion with people who were there to say, we really want something to, to take back to our PI to say, hey, so some of them who are practitioners themselves are very much up for, yes, we want to start doing this, but they also want to be able to sell it to their PI to say, this is important to do. Look, everybody else in the community is doing this. So we thought like, yeah, it, it may, if it's not a, a paper reference, it could still be something else, but something that kind of backs to why, why we chose this. Yeah, that's really good feedback. And I think, I think what I'll do is I will put this on the next agenda for the uh, metrics development working group because you, you kind of got me thinking that this is, you know, this is something that maybe a couple of chaos newcomers uh, or people who are looking for ways to contribute more to the chaos project could probably help contribute because uh, it's a matter of, you know, for, well, having access to the academic publications. So it probably needs to be a student or professor. Um, but also, like you said, you know, searching and, and looking at you know, other other places where some of these metrics are used and, and collecting those and building up the reference section a little bit more than what we have before. So that's that's really good feedback. I will I'll add that to the agenda for the metrics working group. So so Don, what is the metrics working group? Is that a separate meeting from this one? Yes. So we have we have a whole bunch of working groups within the Chaos Project. This is this is one that we call a context working group. So we also have an OSPO working group that's focused on corporate open source program offices and we have one on universities and um, academia and and then this one for scientific software so we have those three what we call context working groups so in those groups we have discussions like the one we're having now which is what type of metrics do we need uh what what else do you need out of the metrics how can we get the data out of some of the tools that we have and so those are the conversations we have in, in these types of meetings and then we have a whole separate set of meetings. We have a metrics working group meeting, a metrics development working group meeting, and a metrics model development working group meeting. And in both of those meetings, we actually write metrics and metrics models. And de we develop new metrics, we edit existing metrics, um, and we do the, the detailed work on the metrics that in a lot of cases, not everybody in the context working groups necessarily wants to you know, dive into a particular set of set of metrics. So it, it's, a, they're overlapping audiences, but it's a slightly different audience, I think, for the, the development of the metrics. Working gotcha. groups. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And we also have a data science working group where we talk about data science things, oh, cool. along with a few, uh, a few others. Hey, can I, um, can I ask, just because you mentioned the, the OSPO one, um, and, and industry specifically, and then there's university OSPOs, is, um, do, do the university OSPOs get talked about in that OSPO working group or do they get talked about in the university working group or both or neither? Typically the university working group. Um, okay. we, we split those out because what we realized pretty quickly was that corporate OSPOs and university OSPOs care about vastly different things and in different ways. So uh, the conversations we found weren't, weren't really all that overlapping except probably in a few, few cases. Um, but they, they do tend to be very, very different conversations that we have in both of those groups. Okay. And is the university working group just on us? And, or is it, sorry, is it broader, I guess? So I would say the unit. So the university working group, it does include university OSPOs, but it is also, and but that encompasses really, I would say that that working group is focused on from the institution of each individual university and how they are addressing open source internally and as it pertains to intellectual property and, and, and concerns like that. Whereas this working group that we're in right now has been more focused on the scientists developing software and how to support them. And those are, so there's like three different things here, Dan, I think <laughs> three different groups that have somewhat intersecting, but, but uh, distinct enough that we have different discussions. And, yeah. different and for them. 
and the other thing I'll point out is these are these are community meetings that anyone anyone can join. So if you think you would get value out of joining either the corporate OSPO or the university OSPO working group, um, I would encourage you. I would encourage you to join. You can have a look at our minutes from the past couple of meetings and see see what we talk about. But um, but they're not. We don't have hard and fast rules for who can attend those. So we have people in the corporate one who aren't actually in OSPOs who just do open source work within companies. And we have people from universities who also, and governments who attend the corporate OSPO one as well, because they get benefit out of doing so. So I would say whichever, whichever one seems to fit your needs best, feel free to attend some others if you'd like to. got quiet all of a sudden is it just are there other yeah no i was i was giving the moment pause uh i so if, if if i'm understanding right i i think maybe having some examples of how how groups of projects like from foundations can be referenced um as part of our discussion might be helpful yeah, I, I think that the, we could even work collaboratively on that. The main thing that I was really struggling to find out is how can we find out which projects really belong to which foundation if somebody has that data? So what I was hoping to do is if we even started out with one example set um, and we put some, let's say, 10 of those projects in Augur and looked at some specific characteristics, whatever might be available in Augur, I think that gives us some place to start with. Uh, the, the the foundations that we've been working most closely with is NumFocus. Um, and, and I think if we had to pick one foundation to begin with, I mean, I think NumFocus, because we have done on our project, we and we are connected to them. We do know a lot of projects that are part of it. But uh, they, we did a foundations forum a while back on our project, which had three or four, so we had invited Apache. So I was just thinking, you know, to kind of give um, some context based on data and example projects, it, if we had some lists where we had access to, we don't have to, to start tracking every single project right away, but I think it'd be good to have that list and then see which ones are the interesting ones or similar to us. And then maybe we could track those. So you could just go through the projects, GitHub real fast and come up with the list to submit to Augur. And then the next thing that I was really hoping we could do is I'll go look at that schema so we can find out what else is in the schema and would probably be interesting to track for both our projects and the example projects and try to get that to you guys. So I think that would might be really helpful collaborative work with chaos that would really help us on our side. But I did want to get and I think um... go for it. I'm excited about what you're saying to be, to be candid. And so Dawn and I are, have been um, on the Augur instance, we're working on making it more performant. Um, I'm having a little bit of an issue because after open source summit, North America, there's over 105,000 projects um, in it, including I think every single one of the projects that you mentioned. Um, however, I don't have enough um, resources to make it, easily available for more than collecting the data and presenting it in the dashboard. So ad hoc querying against the database that's being like massively inserted to all the time, as you as you probably know, it's just a nightmare. So we need like, we need a read only instance and I'm in the process of getting resources to make that possible. And my, my, my PhD students are actually working right now on identifying what I would characterize as prototypical projects at different stages using the CNCF vernacular, like your, your um, sandbox, your incubating and your graduated projects, and then using models to, to try to identify a category for projects that we, we don't know that information for. 
So it's a little bit of human intervention combined with machine learning where we're trying to do some of the things at scale and at least prototype them. And I, I think I mentioned the infrastructure and that question because being able to do all that is related. And and I think it would might be a very fun project for this group, but also perhaps a, a side project that could lead to some research publications as well. Um, there's, I think, a ton to say in this space and a ton that is un, undone at this point. I don't know, like a, a ton of opportunity for, for people who like to write papers. Absolutely. And, yeah, and, and this was this was something that I dug into a fair bit. Um, and it ended up being quite a bit, quite a bit of manual work, to be honest, to, to gather some of that foundation data. But we we had a data scientist within, within VMware when I worked at VMware who was looking at all of our contributions, of, you know, contributions that employee made employees made to various projects. And whether they were foundation for companies or you know, our own project, and so we had this this piece of work around that. And so I did have, sadly, I think all of that code is probably still at VMware because I don't think it was. I don't think we published it open source. Um, but that that used some of these landscape documents to to get a little bit of that data. Um, but it is a really interesting problem, and it does give you a really interesting insight, I think, into um, you know just into some of the work and projects. So I, I really, I really like the idea. I share some of Sean's concerns about just the logistics of putting that data in Augur and being able to use it uh, right now, given all of the other other constraints that we have. Sure. So we... Yeah. I mean, I hopefully the go ahead. Eddie, Eddie's hand is up. So one thing that I think maybe probably we don't understand as well is that is Augur the name for the front end or is also the back end? Because honestly, we don't necessarily need all of the front end dashboards. We just need the data for those projects in the schema and the tables that we could possibly query. And I think in some ways it might be nicer too because the, the way Augur displays the matrix is just project by project. But what we want to see is a lot of projects data together in some table or view to kind of do a quick compare. So if there is not that much of a load for the back end part, then, and you know, it's a, a, a much bigger lift to get, like change the matrix out to have different matrix on the front end, we probably don't necessarily have to, as long as we can pull those matrix and query them in some format to see if there's anything interesting here. And then once we know what's interesting, what would be useful to the projects, then we can look into the dashboards and things. But one thing I did want to mention about uh, the, the GitHub uh, idea that I was talking about, because it's trying to get an intern this summer to do this. I mean, that fell apart. But what I had found out was that uh, a lot of the foundations are GitHub orgs. And what GitHub API lets you do is they let you look up the org of the repo or given an org, all the repos underneath it. So that was the idea we were going to, to pick to say, okay, let's go for Apache. Let's go for a few big ones that are GitHub org again, ask their projects to, to be listed under that org. So at least we know the projects in a in a less manual way, possibly. So that's what, what I meant when I said org. So I'm pretty sure that not all foundations work this way and maybe some of them don't make their projects list under their GitHub org. So we would be missing out their data for sure. So yes, I agree that it has to definitely be combined with other efforts and less in data sources, but we could possibly get a couple of them that do that, that do this via GitHub. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. Yeah, there yeah, what I've what I've found in my experience is that a lot of these nonprofits, because the projects are so large, that each of the projects has their own GitHub org. I see. So I think that's probably less common in the scientific software community because some of your projects tend to be a bit um, smaller and self, you know, more self-contained. Like if you look at CNCF projects, they're all in their own separate organizations. They're not. They're they're really not under the the CNCF org. Okay. Uh, and just brief aside, Dan and Jonathan have their hands up. Uh, we do load the whole org for the CNCF. So like the, yeah, the org, when the org makes sense, we just load the whole org. Um, Dan, uh, D Jonathan and Dan, I don't know. Who should I'll be very first. brief and see what order and they Dan will be in. able to. 
speak much better to the NumFocus side of how NumFocus handles the, the scientific research projects. But there, uh, Eddie, you mentioned a table of just side-by-side -side comparison of a bunch of stuff. Um, if this helps chaos prioritize things in any way, I would also love that. I will map the bejesus out of that if that exists. Uh, and we'll make a very nice visual to be able to explore uh, that table and that array. That would be so fun. That's all. Yeah, and and then I was I was just thinking about yeah. uh, about things like um, the the DOAP or description of a project thing that Apache was doing at one point, um, which I think I don't know this is the one link I could find for this, but but some way that um, basically organizations or repositories that want to that want to be involved in this actually can kind of opt in in some sense and have a a flag that lets i say, yes, these are the ones we want to work on or, or something like that. Uh, I, I, this may not be the right thing. This is pretty old at this point, but um, but some, basically some kind of marker that they put into the repository that we could that we could then look at. I, I geez, I, I don't, I've never seen this before, Dan, but wouldn't it be great if this was taken up? And also, I love the name of the dope. Like, what a great name, dope. Do you know how, have you seen this? Are there examples of repositories where you've seen this used, Dan? So the, I think, I'm trying to remember this. Um, there's like, there was a blog post that I wrote about catalogs, um, probably like in 2016 or something like that. And this was one of the things that I was, that I came across at that point. Um, it was partly because, uh, ah, okay, 2015. Um, this uh, so there. This is partly because uh, DARPA and some other agencies were trying to build catalogs of their software, and they were using. I don't know if they were using this exactly, but they were using something like this at one point to to figure out what they should put into their catalogs. Um, I think this was actually at the time that I was at NSF. I saw the link that you sent. Yeah, the, I think this is when I was at NSF and I was trying to figure out how I was going to catalog the software that we were funding. Um, because we we had a catalog of grants, but the grants didn't actually necessarily tie to one repository. Um, and so there was this kind of confusion about how to manage yeah. repositories. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that I know. I've, uh, when I worked with about it, so. Then yeah, I, I mean, I, my, I've done a. Go ahead, Daddy. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. It's a slightly different topic, so don't want to move away from this. I was just gonna say that, like, working at uh, helping CZI analyze their funded work, finding the map from what they funded to the repositories is a a winding exercise, and I know James Howison has gone and Karthik Graham have gone through the same thing where when they're trying to map a funding stream like an NSF grant to the repositories, it's a, it's an unclean mapping. Like it's not pretty oftentimes. Just right. to reinforce your thought there, Dan. Yeah. Well, and, it, and I guess, again, as I was thinking about this, I, I wasn't really thinking about machine learning at that point, but, right, but today right, machine learning would potentially be a way of doing this, of just searching for repositories, maybe in the case of NSF that have NSF in their um, in the README and maybe have an award number or something like that and trying to do a mapping that way. But the, but I guess what I was thinking was that just, can we just ask the people that are funded to do some tiny bit of work that helps us do this so we don't have to do it in some kind of semi-automated way that may not be right. I uh, think a way to- Right, but- I, I, That would be amazing. And I think a way to get people to do that is to show the value they will receive if they do that. If, I don't think we'll be able to just be like, hey, can you please do this? Because we want it <laughs> and have a project format everything in a specific way. But if we can say, hey, can you please do this? Because once we digest this data, there's going to be a great chance or an increased chance that you get future funding or future support or something like that. Right. The other, and I'll just say one other thing really quickly on this, sorry, Eddie, uh, which is that um, there is the citation.cff file that GitHub is supporting. 
that's yeah. basically in some ways you could think of as a flag for research software or at least for software that somebody wants to have cited. And so I guess I, I kind of wonder, I don't think that that has any kind of a funding flag in it or a organization flag, but we could think about maybe overlaying something else in that and and trying to use that as opposed to the this, this DOAP, which again, seems like it's more dead where the citation files are more alive at this point. There's actually, a Eddie, can I try to do this? Okay, there's a, there's a project that has Eddie had a stop, little bit, <laughs> had a little bit of success in getting a file uploaded to repos because they tie it directly to funding. So they're, they're called drips. They're um, more in web three, but they have a bunch of money that they just allocate to open source projects. Uh, and the way that a, uh, project claims that money is by putting a file in the repo, a very specific file. Uh, and so if it, it's getting uh, traction with some projects because they're like, oh my God, there's like $100,000 here. Yes, I'll put this file in my repo. So if we can talk to projects like that maybe and say, hey, can you add this schema to that file as a requirement to get access to the funds that already exist behind the repo? I think we might have some success, some success there. Exactly. <laughs> Addy, you're um Yeah, so I you've waited I wanted, patiently. No, that's all right. I just wanted to sort of like pitch in and say that actually, uh, I don't know if some of you have met Reed, Reed Melovis and and myself. We are actually doing some work on this because we were so interested. So it's not out there yet. We submitted to XC, it's under review, but what we ended up doing is we did indeed do the search for award numbers and papers. And we also uh, basically took a whole bunch of projects and ran uh, them through Olama and big LLM models to answer the question that, hey, do these belong to a grant? Do these belong to a foundation? Do these belong to any scientific papers to see if we can get some information, some kind of data source that is more or less accurate? I mean, the LLMs will never be perfect, but we tried searching and then augmented it with, uh, with the LLMs a little bit. Part of our motivation was that we just were trying to see if there are any common properties that correlate with sustainability or longevity and how do we identify those projects because we don't have a good data source. But then we went wider because we thought maybe other people could use this data source for something else. So I think it's definitely very interesting. We found that Papers to Code, which is another big project, uh, comes out of uh, Meta's AI labs. They have done a lot of this mapping in a different way. So they go to the papers, find out the artifact locations, link that GitHub repo to grants and papers. So we were able to validate um, some of ours with their information, but looks like there are a bunch of people doing this in, in relatively smaller specific areas, but I think it would definitely be, be great to have some kind of um, data source, but I completely agree with Dan. The best thing would be that if the funding bodies would just say, you already tell us which papers are linked to this grant, please tell us which software is linked to this grant, because it's just that information is not available from any of the grant bodies. So just wanted to share that. I know NSF has started to support scientific open source a little bit more directly with Pose, which is a interesting program. Uh, I wonder if um, I did. It's been a while since I had to write an NSF report, but I just wonder if linking software will become more standard. Clearly, it should. So something that I wanted to get back to and discuss for a second, and I'm I'm sorry, I apologize for this. I think we just kind of went off on a tangent. Don, you were telling us about these new practice guides, and and I did want to hear more about them. Sorry, having a hard time finding my mute button. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm happy to chat more about those. These are these are something that. Uh, came out of a couple of things. They came out of a lot of the discussions we've been having in some of the working groups, like the OSCO working group, as well as the survey that I did back in August about understanding the challenges that people have with, with chaos software. So um, just as a reminder, Sean, you're still sharing your screen. Okay. Um, 
Um, so, I think I'm on the right thing now. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I click a link and it pops up. So. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so so what we found is that one of the challenges people have with with the metrics is that there's there's so much that they don't really they don't really know where to start and they don't know what to do with it once once they have the data. So these were targeted at practitioners. So these are people who may or may not have loads of experience with data, but they're people who need to interpret what they're seeing in their metrics and be able to make improvements based on those. So these really are focused not just on, on measuring things, but what you do with that data once you have it and how do you actually use it to make your open source projects better. So that was the, the goal behind the practitioner's guide. And so we launched with the first four guides. So there's an introduction, responsiveness, contributor sustainability, and organizational participation. So those were the four guides that we launched with. We have more that are still work in progress. So we're continuing to work on them and people can propose new guides if there's some new topic that you want to um, uh, that you think would be interesting for us to write a practitioner guide or you want to write a practitioner guide. So they're very much a, a chaos community uh, asset, both for people writing them and for, for the people consuming those. So that was, yeah, that's pretty much what I, what I have left around those. Any questions on the practitioner guides? So just one question, Don, that are they yeah. targeted towards uh, um, the project coordinators, the developers of the project? Because I was wondering, like, who can we forward this practitioner guides to and say, look, you should really be looking at these? They're, they're really targeted toward uh, the people who have the ability to make changes to projects, right? So the people who have the abilities to make the improvements to projects or the people who influence the ones that do. So. What we, where we see this being used right now is a lot of the um, uh, OSPOs are uh, using these guides with the people within their company that they mentor and help with open source projects. Uh, maintainers are another uh, good target for these uh, community managers, but they're basically based on topics. So some of the topics might be, might be things that a particular project needs to improve and, and some of them won't be. So, you know, you may, if you have loads of contributors and your project seems to be super sustainable and you have enough contributors to sustain the project, maybe you don't need to read the contributor sustainability project or um, contributor sustainability uh, guide. If you have a big project and you have two maintainers and they're hopelessly overloaded and the situation is not sustainable, then it might be good to have some people read the contributor sustainability guide to see if there are some things that they can improve. It may or may not be those two poor overloaded maintainers who need to, uh, uh, you know, read it and understand it and, and look at the metrics behind it. So it, it depends a lot on the individual situation. So one thing I wanted to ask just on the OSPO that I know um, I read some articles uh, from the to-do group. Is there some collaboration with them? Are there people common in, in the, our OSPO working groups and the to-do group? Oh yeah, absolutely. The, the OSPO working group is actually a joint effort between Chaos and the Shadu group. Okay. And there are a number of us. So I I participate in in the Shadu group uh, channels quite a bit. I was actually just having some conversations in there uh, yesterday and today. So there there are a number of us uh, that participate in both. And I would say most of the participants within the OSPO working group are also Shadu group members. Nice. Perfect. Yeah. And Don and I have, have, have worked with the to-do group on a number of their topology meetings over the last couple of years as well. So we're about at time. We're actually at time right now. Um, so for our next meeting, I won't be here. Um, so I don't know if there's anybody that wants to volunteer to coordinate, but at the meeting, two meetings from now, um, I can bring back some of the work that my group, my research, my PhD students are doing um, around finding classification schemes using uh, declared projects like CNCF stages and other things that might fit into this discussion we're having right now pretty well. Um, and other than that, I'll just create an agenda and um, is there anybody that wants to volunteer to coordinate the meeting in two weeks?
Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens then. <laughs> Don, you're muted. I think I see your lips moving in it. I don't know if you're trying to talk to us or someone else. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm on a laptop Sorry. and so I'm switching between screens. Um, I, I was looking to see if I could run that. Uh, it's on the 30th, right? Um, yeah. yeah, you can put me down for that. I'll do that. All right. Thank you, Don. Yeah, no worries. All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, Don will see you in two weeks, and uh, I'll see you in four weeks. Thank you. And, uh, Bye, everybody. See you then. Bye.